Welcome to the OpenStack Summit, April 2013. Uh, this is, a, I think, a great example of the power of OpenStack. How many open source projects have their own hip hop group? Not a lot. Although, you know, I do remember them before they went corporate. And I think, you know, some of their original stuff was really good. But. So, uh, I'm Jonathan Bryce, and uh, I'm the executive director of the OpenStack Foundation. And um, I am going to uh, cover a few things this morning and have some special guests up here. And I think we're going to have a, a really good morning with uh, a lot of good speakers who are going to talk about what people are doing with OpenStack out in the wild. It's going to be really exciting. Um, but first, uh, a few housekeeping items. So these are your badges. A lot of the information that you might have a question about is going to show up on the back of that badge. If you uh, are wondering how you get to the Wi-Fi, um, where the parties are, everything is on there. Uh, you can see that uh, a lot of that's on, on the badge here. This upper area, registration, um, general session hall, uh, most of the, the events are happening downstairs. That's where the food is, the expo hall, the breakout sessions, and the design summit. Um, and I think you know, that's, that's uh, pretty much it. Keep it simple. How do you guys like the hoodies this time around? Yeah. It's a little different. We've done a lot of t-shirts, so we decided to do a hoodie. Uh, did anybody find the Easter egg on the back? The OpenStack itself is made up of uh, all of the places where we have OpenStack user groups. And uh, I think this just goes to show that OpenStack is made of users. <laughs> and this is, um, I think, you know, really an homage to what we're trying to do. We're trying to build great software as a community and, uh, and get it deployed all around the world. Um, you know, just one other thing before we get the day kicked off. We are a global community, and in the last day, there have been a couple of tragedies. Uh, you probably have all heard about Boston, and uh, overnight there were some earthquakes in India and Iran, and we have, uh, we have community members in, in all of those places. And I just wanted to take a moment um, just to pause and, uh, and just kind of, you know, let them know that our hearts go out to all of those who might be affected. So the OpenStack Foundation is a pretty new entity. We uh, have been in existence for just a little over six months, actually. This is the first summit that, that we've uh, put on and funded. And you know, I think uh, it's something where, that has grown incredibly. We have uh, just about twice as many people here as we had in San Diego six months ago. And that's really amazing, you know, doubling in, in six months. And you know, this venue is much bigger. We have a lot more space. I know that some of the rooms are still crowded. We're going to keep working on it <laughs> and uh, keep getting better and better at it. But um, you know, this, is, uh, this is something that's possible because of uh, the support of all of you, all of the individual members, and also the, uh, the corporate members of the foundation and the sponsors of the summit itself. There have been a, a number of things that we've done and, uh, and you know, helped the community to execute on over the last six months. Can't talk about all of them, but I just wanted to highlight a few that I think are really excellent examples of the power of community, of harnessing this worldwide group of people who are passionate about OpenStack, who want to go out and do great things with it. Um, one of the things that, uh, that happened earlier this year was we got a group of people together and uh, put them in a room for a week, and they wrote a book. They wrote the Operations Guide for OpenStack. And this was, uh, this was another great example of just global collaboration. We had authors from Australia, from Canada, from Germany, from the US. They all came together in Austin, Texas. And sometimes, you know, Texans think that's a country of its own as well. So you could add that to the count, perhaps. Uh, and in a week, produce this, this book. So it was, uh, it was really, a, I think, a, a great thing that, um, that uh, came out of this. And you can find this on our, on our docs site. You can find links to it. And um, we've had uh, thousands of downloads from over 100 countries around the world. So this is already uh, getting a lot of great information into the hands of users all over the planet. Um, another program that we started was the, uh, the GNOME Outreach uh, for Women, which this is a, a, a program that the GNOME Foundation organizes, and they go out and they work with different projects to, um, to sponsor interns and to, uh, to bring women into uh, different technology projects. And we had three interns that have been working with OpenStack, and it's, it's been awesome to see them get involved in the project, 
make contributions to code, help with documentation. Um, these, uh, these three women are, are in uh, locations around the world and they're here this week, so um, they're doing a session and I hope that you can, uh, you can find them and talk to them and hear about their experiences. It's also been helpful to hear what it's like for people to come and try to get in, involved in the community. So that was uh, another thing that, uh, that I think we did that was, that was pretty great. And then um, for uh, other news, to hear about um, what we're doing, to tell us what you think we should be doing, we're doing an open house on Thursday afternoon after we, uh, after we kind of wrap up the summit. It's gonna be across the street at the Spirit of 77. It's on, on the bottom of your badge. So we hope to, see, uh, hope to see a lot of you there. Come and bring your questions, your suggestions. So we're, I think we're calling it the open mic night. So if you wanna do a, a, a little poetry, you're welcome to do that too. And, uh, and I think it'll be a, a good time. Um, you know, about six months ago, we had a peaceful transition of power, so to speak, over to the foundation for the, uh, for the OpenStack project. And it was something that a lot of people said, you know, this is really risky to go create a foundation. This project has a lot of momentum. Is it going to throw it off? I think we've seen that that has not been the case. And I just wanted to take a moment to, uh, to, to kind of mention another peaceful transition of power that just happened in the last month. We've had some technical leaders that have really um, helped to drive OpenStack forward over the last couple of years. And uh, four of them in this last uh, election for our project technical leads um, stepped aside, and they're still involved in the projects, but they allowed new leadership to step up. And I just wanted to, to take a moment to thank Vish, Brian, Dan, and Joe for the leadership on their respective projects. You can talk to any of them. You know, PTL is a, uh, it's a busy task. It's, it's not, a, uh, not an easy job, and it's one that a lot of times happens behind the scenes. Um, and you know, we now have uh, new leaders that are stepping up, and it really speaks to the depth of our technical bench and OpenStack that uh, you know, this transition has happened, and uh, we have great new leaders in these projects who are working with, uh, with these four still. So thank you to, uh, to you guys. So I just have a few quick thoughts about what we're doing. You know, this is uh, obviously something that's growing, that's big, that has um, a lot of interest around it, and a lot of contribution around it. But uh, you know, what, what is it that we're, that we're really doing here? Because it's not just software. It's not just a great development community. It's not just about having a bunch of companies and vendors involved. You know, all of those things are important. But um, any one of them on their own is not enough. And, uh, and I think that what we're really doing is we're building a new platform ecosystem for the cloud. And so what is that? You know, what is a platform ecosystem? Um, platform ecosystems are what develop when you have a base level of technology that is widely adopted and extensible, and it allows for a lot of innovation to happen around it. Let's do a little audience survey here. So, <laughs> somebody loves surveys. How many of you have a smartphone? All right, so this is uh, most people. Keep your hand up. Yes. All right, so it's pretty much the whole audience. Now, put your hand down if that phone is an iPhone or an Android device. <laughs> Those are platforms. You know, platforms develop in massive markets, and they gain a, a very large share of those markets. You know, um, iPhone, Android, they both have half a billion devices uh, in, you know, in these incredibly large markets. And if we look at, uh, at what OpenStack is doing, we are creating powerful general purpose technology that's also in another massive market. We're talking about every data center and everything in that data center. All of the servers, all of the network devices, all of the storage devices, orchestrating all of that, putting a common API on top of it, letting people extend it, build on top of it, make it more valuable. I mean, that's, that's really incredible to think about what we're doing and what the opportunity is in front of us as, as we do that. When we uh, think about platforms, there are some influencing factors for them. And uh, I like to uh, fly around in little planes. You know, not, they don't have jet engines. But you know, if you've uh, ever studied flight or aerodynamics, there are four forces that act on an airplane that determine you know, if it stays in flight, if it, if it climbs, if it descends, all of those kinds of things, lift, weight, thrust, and drag. And, uh, and when we look at a platform ecosystem, we, we say there are three forces that act within a platform ecosystem. You have to have powerful software, powerful technology. 
You have to have an innovative ecosystem of people who are collaborating around it, who are extending it, who are adding extra functionality, and then you have to have successful users, and users who are out there making use of that platform and, uh, and taking advantage of that ecosystem. We were talking about smartphones a minute ago. You know, that's phone, it comes with an operating system, it probably has the ability to make calls, to send text messages, but what makes it so powerful is, you know, you can get the SCED application on iPhone or Android and see what's going on here this week. You can get games, you can get all sorts of applications that make you more productive or, you know, enjoy that downtime while you're sitting there waiting for the plane to come. And, and these three forces, really, the stronger they are, the more they're focused to the center, the more that platform grows and succeeds, and it, it's like gravity, creates the center of gravity that continues to pull in more innovation, continues to pull in more development, making the software better, continues to pull in more users. So this is, I think, a, you know, a, an important concept to think about and, uh, and something that is really, uh, really applies to what we're doing with OpenStack. So if we were to break this down a little bit and look at each of these forces and look at the way that, that OpenStack plays within them, powerful software. I'm assuming that most of you are familiar with this. If you're not, this is a good place to come and learn about OpenStack and what the software is. We have 250 plus sessions this week along with uh, another couple hundred in the design summit. So this is, this is the place to get your content and learn about this. But OpenStack is software for building public and private clouds and doing it at, at large scale and at small scale. And it's really focused around compute, storage, and networking. And interacting with, with those components, controlling them, making them more efficient and more agile. We just had our seventh release, Grizzly. So this is uh, you know, exciting every time we have a release and then we get to come together to these summits and, and celebrate them. And I think that it's worth pointing out, this is uh, the seventh release that we've done on time with all of the major features. So for almost three years now, We've been doing what we say, and I think that's a, that's a really a, a great mark, especially in the software industry. Um, you know, if we were to look at Grizzly just quickly, we've got some screenshots here. We have a video demo on our website. If you go to openstack.org slash grizzly, and you can check it out in action. But Grizzly has a, has a lot of cool features. I think the block storage environment is really great now. It's, a, it's kind of a true service for storage in the data center. You can manage multiple types of storage behind the, a single block storage service. And, uh, and one API, um, you can manage networks now with a lot of new drivers for a lot of new networking companies, um, software-defined networking, and also kind of traditional networking appliances. The interface for this, uh, this dashboard has improved and has a lot of new capabilities when you're setting up new instances, when you're configuring networks. One of my favorite features is this network topology view, where you can really see a multi-tier application laid out and graphed as you're creating these, uh, these different resources inside of your cloud. So the software, you know, I think has, has come a really long way. And the, uh, the development team has come a long way as well. One year ago, we were in San Francisco, same thing, you know, summit after the Essex release. And we had about 250 developers. Um, they don't all look the same, that was just <laughs> the easiest way to represent them. If you go from Essex to Grizzly, we've gone from 250 to well over 500 developers. I mean, that's really amazing in, in a year. And we've added new projects, and we've had new talent come in, and that's what's powering OpenStack forward. So if, if you're in the room right now and you contributed to Grizzly, stand up. Now let's give them a round of applause. Thank you, guys. I mean, you are, you are making the software and I think that you're gonna be excited to see what we have the rest of the day. So this is, this is great progress on the software front, and that's a really key pillar of, of the forces. If we move on, we're talking about the innovative ecosystem. And when you think about OpenStack, one of the things that a lot of people say is, well, they have all those companies involved. And there's a little bit of irony there because I remember when we were getting going, everybody said, well, there's only one company involved. So we didn't have enough, you know, it was all rack space, but now we have too many, and, you know, it's kind of, it's hard to make everybody happy, right? But the innovative ecosystem is really important in platforms because a platform is a general purpose technology and it has to have a good level of functionality that meets a lot of needs, but, it, but there's never any technology that meets all needs. And a platform enables 
different services, different companies, different software to take that platform and make it really valuable for specific use cases. And, and that's really, you know, very critical. So, you know, we go back to 2010. July of 2010, we were actually in this building on the south side, the south side of the building, and we were um, at OSCON. And that was where we announced OpenStack. And uh, there was, you know, it was an exciting time. People were really excited. We dropped code the day we launched. But then, you know, there was also uh, some skepticism. Does this, does this sound familiar to anyone? This is uh, something that, if you followed OpenStack, you've probably heard this kind of skepticism before. Well, you know, we were, uh, we were talking about other things that happened around the same time frame. And what's interesting is July of 2010, just a few days before OpenStack, just before, you know, we made the decision and announced the decision to open source this software, there was a, another group of industry heavyweights that came together. And they made a decision as well to form up a team, and it was met with the same level of skepticism. <laughs> About three days before we announced OpenStack was when LeBron James announced he was going to the Miami Heat with Dwayne Ray Wade and Chris Bosh. That year they went to the finals. The next year they won the finals. And you know, I have to say, I think we've had some wins of our own. And, uh, and you know, it's really exciting to see, uh, to see how, how we've come together. We were gonna get everyone championship rings, but too many of you came, so we had to go with hoodies. Sorry. Yeah. But really, I think that you know, all of this noise about so many companies involved and the risk and all of that, it's, it's really a red herring. That is, that's driving innovation. We go back to compute, storage, and networking. There is a lot of work to do there. And what those companies are doing is they're bringing in experts, like those PTLs we saw, like the new developers that are here this summit. They're bringing those experts and their domain into OpenStack, and they're contributing code, and they're driving it forward. And that is part of the, the amazing power of OpenStack. And you know, it's not just about the companies, too. And this is one of the things that I've loved to see over the last year or so. Um, we have a lot of open source projects that are aligning themselves with OpenStack, with the way that we um, do our releases, that we do our process. They are tying into our development tools, our um, continuous integration, our testing frameworks. And I think that is, again, it shows the, the power of building a platform like this, not just in the cloud, but with our development processes. And we get innovation all over the place. So that's, that is a, a, such a key part of OpenStack and such a key part of platforms. And finally, you know, the, the real key is successful users. And this is, a, again, you know, an area that I love to talk about, because we have great users. And um, you know, the, we have a lot of them here this, this week. And I love that they come to this because we have empowered users. You know, we have users that are ready to come, engage in a design summit, talk to developers, work with the user committee, and help us all make the software better based off of their experiences. But you know, the, uh, um, one of the things that, that happens is people say when a lot. You know, when are we going to have real companies using OpenStack? And I'm going to make a prediction right now. I'm feeling bold. I think that one day, we're going to see companies in industries that we know about running services that we use every day on OpenStack. I mean, that's what this is doing. This is going into all of those areas. And these companies are going to use OpenStack to power the services that we're using every day. And you know, we like to do time-based releases. We like to put dates on things, and then we like to hit them. So I'm going to put a date on this, on when we're going to hear about these companies doing it. <laughs> yes, right now. We are extremely fortunate to have some users who have come to share their stories today. And, uh, and I think that it's going to be you know, really interesting to hear how they're using OpenStack. And again, you know, these are brands that, that you know, that you interact with. So let's go ahead and, and get started with this. And, uh, um, what we're going to do is we're going to run through a couple of different users and customers here. They've got some great stuff to show. And so I'm going to go ahead and start, bring up Praveer Chandri from Bloomberg. And uh, Praveer is going to tell us about, about uh, what they are doing with OpenStack at Bloomberg. So Praveer Chandri. Thanks. Thanks. Hey, what's up? Uh, so a little over a year and a half ago, when I first got pinged by a recruiter uh, from Bloomberg, my first thought was, what is Bloomberg? 
What, 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 what does Bloomberg do? And so uh, I've come to learn this, which is important. Um, we're, a, we're a services company. We're a services company that's incredibly focused on our customers. Uh, and the service that we provide is primarily financial data and analytics uh, for people in the financial space. Primarily, we do a lot of other things too. We have a TV channel and a you know, radio channel and all that kind of stuff. But uh, just to give you an idea of, of kind of the scale of it, um, what it means really is that we're a technology company uh, because we have to be a technology company in order to provide all these services. And just to give you a feel for that, on a given day, we process about or, or send out about 22 million instant messages. That's not terribly interesting. Uh, we also do about 220 million uh, uh, messages, so like emails. Um, again, that's kind of interesting. Then I came to learn that we actually run one of the largest private networks in the world. We have around uh, 20,000 routers that run across our, our private WAN. Uh, we also uh, have the largest server-side JavaScript deployment in the world. We have 22 million lines of JavaScript code that's in production running on our server side. Um, and we also, this is one of the more interesting stats, uh, process tick data from financial markets. So when there's market feeds that are coming in, we, we process all that data. There's 45 to 50 billion ticks per day. Uh, and for those counting along at home, if you were counting with a UN32, you would have overrun it 10 to 11 times every day. Uh, so that's, that's kind of an, a, just a feel for what we do in terms of technology. And so when we started looking at OpenStack, uh, we had some, some interesting design goals that we had in mind for this kind of elastic infrastructure that we wanted to build. Uh, the first focus that we had was primarily on high availability. That's really important for us, and, it, and it's incredibly important also when it came to our architecture to make sure that we didn't have an architecture that would have a, you know, opportunities for cascading failures, right? We didn't want to have a cloud infrastructure that we put up that would have one thing that goes wrong and then cascades down the line and takes the whole service down. That's, of course, you know, it's not something that we can live with. Uh, in addition to that, uh, another design goal that we had was to try to make sure that we were uh, scaling down to small sizes, not only scaling up. Uh, we have a lot of node sites around the world, about 200 or so uh, points of presence throughout the world. And the opportunity to actually have a programmatically you know, defined infrastructure in those locations is huge. It actually saves us a lot of time, a lot of energy, and it makes us very nimble when it comes to actually being able to deploy those kinds of uh, services uh, to different parts of the world. Uh, in addition to that, another design goal that we had was to try to keep our stack as, as open source as possible and in well-defined layers so that we could actually, if something went wrong, actually pull a layer out and replace it with a new piece. Uh, so kind of looking kind of forward into, into what we were, uh, when we started kind of analyzing OpenStack and thinking about how we were going to actually use it, uh, we came across a few kinds of problems that we had to solve on our own. So there was, I'm going to put them into two categories. There's kind of problems that are below OpenStack and then problems that are sort of above OpenStack. Uh, so when it came to problems below OpenStack, we had to sort out, you know, how do we do highly available databases, right? We ended up uh, settling on using the Glara plugin for MySQL to do kind of a multi-master setup. We had to figure out how to do availability of the message queue. So we did some RabbitMQ clustering and had to play around with HA policies and things of that nature in order to get that piece right. Um, in addition to that, we also had to figure out even more basic things than that, which is what's the hardware platform that we're going to use? What, what kind of servers are we going to use? Um, and it kind of related to that was also how are we going to do storage in a highly available fashion? Uh, to which uh, we actually ended up using Ceph uh, with the awesome guys from Ink Tank that have helped us out tremendously with that. Um, so, so those are kind of some of the problems that were below OpenStack that we had to solve. Um, and then OpenStack, of course, plugged in really nicely and, and solved a lot of our problems in terms of giving us the APIs and the programmatically definable infrastructure. But then there was another layer on top of OpenStack that we also had to work out. Um, and that was, how do we do uh, some of the basic housekeeping things? So how do we do you know, log aggregation and things like that from the hypervisor level? So we ended up putting together a system involving uh, Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana. People, you know, people have done that before. It's not really uh, all that new. Um, we also had to sort of define a layer for doing metrics for the hypervisor. So in terms of actually collecting information to make sure that our infrastructure was healthy. So we ended up using graphite and some tomfoolery with carbon relays and caches and things like that. Um, uh, in addition to that, we also had some orchestration issues that we had to sort out. So when it comes to individual hypervisors or an individual instance of a service, we didn't care so much about how many nines of reliability we were getting out of that. What we wanted was a, the ability to have our five or six nines of availability on the service level, like an aggregate, so that we could actually have an individual instance that dies and nobody cares, and orchestration service sees that it dies and relaunches one in a new availability zone if necessary. 
Uh, and so we had to work on that. We ended up using uh, it, uh, no jitsu, and, and we're actually looking at a few other uh, folks to actually help us sort out that kind of problem. Uh, in addition to that, um, there's also uh, what we wanted to do in terms of like future things, looking in, ter in terms of operational efficiencies. Uh, and one of the interesting technologies that we're just starting to play around with is uh, uh, the VMS technology from GridCentric. Um, so really, the, uh, the, the main thing that I kind of wanted to emphasize here is uh, we had to solve a lot of these problems ourselves, but we wanted other people to be able to learn from it. So go clicker. There we go. Uh, so what we're doing is actually, we just put this up today, so I just wanted to announce it, that we actually took all of the cookbooks that we've had to put together to solve all of these problems, and we're making them available on GitHub. It's under an Apache license. And it's not that we're trying to actually go out there and make this like a huge project that we're you know, trying to rally a big community around, but really it's for folks that had to solve similar problems to us so that people can learn from it. And of course, you know, comments, questions, flames, always warmly accepted. Uh, but uh, other than that, thank you very much. Thank you, Praveer. So, <clears throat> does anybody know who the next one up is going to be? <laughs> it's, uh, it's Circuit City. No. <laughs> I think you probably saw the flash there. You know? I mean, how many of you have ever bought a charging cable, an external hard drive, a laptop, a washer dryer, you know, a TV? There's a good chance that you've been to Best Buy. And uh, perhaps you've used their in-store pickup. Perhaps you've bought something online and had it shipped to you. Well, today we have a couple of great guests from, uh, from Best Buy who are going to tell us about um, what they're doing with, uh, with OpenStack and, uh, and how they're using cloud in general to really drive their industry. So please help me welcome Steve and Joel from Best Buy. Morning, uh, Steve Eastham here, uh, Director of Web Architecture, with me. And I'm Joel Crabb. I'm the Chief Architect for BestBuy.com. So uh, Joel is going to cover uh, kind of the background of uh, Best Buy, what, our, uh, what we're doing in our program. Yeah, so let's just get started. Uh, we're presenting today in another breakout session, and, uh, but today, what we'd like to talk about first is just a little bit about Best Buy. If you didn't know about us, we are considered the largest multi-channel consumer electronics retailer in the world, uh, 11th largest e-commerce site, 1.6 billion visitors last year, and we have a, a very large reward program. So let's talk about our cloud re-architecture. Over the last year, Best Buy has gone on a quest to re-architect our e-commerce platform. And part of that was to move our browse and search to the cloud. So if you take a quick look at this graph in the corner here, that's our traffic graph from uh, Wolfram Alpha. And as you can see, we got a really large spike that spikes right around Thanksgiving. And it's about seven or eight times our normal traffic loads. And so if that doesn't scream out for elastic scaling, uh, I don't know what does. And over holiday this year, which holiday for us is Thanksgiving, we actually served 25% of our traffic off of our new cloud architecture. And this is the first time we've actually even talked about the fact that we have a cloud architecture. So we're rolling that out here. Really, really simply, this is what our architecture looks like. We have a global traffic manager sitting in front of a couple different clouds from different vendors. And then we have our data center in the background. But as consumers, it's really what you see that matters to us. So on the left side, you'll see our old, what we call our product detail page. And on the right side is our new product detail page. The new one is served off the cloud architecture. And you can see the timings on the top, the things that this really did for us and the value that it brought to Best Buy were that the old product detail pages took anywhere from seven to 30 seconds to load. Part of that was because a lot of, of the page was rendered, uh, post-rendered JavaScript so on, on your client itself, and we had no control over how fast our third parties responded. What we did as part of our cloud architecture is serve the entire page 
off the server, so all those third parties now are integrated on our server side, and we can serve that page out to you in about two and a half seconds. And then, why we're actually here today is to talk about our continuous delivery cloud. So we've built, we have about 40 development teams or so that are developing at any particular time on bestbuy.com. And all those teams are using different uh, integration and testing environments because our infrastructure for testing really wasn't that great. And so what that caused us is, is lots of problems in, in teams using things that uh, didn't quite correspond to production. They were making their own serv test services. And so what we wanted to do was make the, something that was consistent and easy for all of our teams to use. So we created what we call the Continuous Delivery Cloud, or the CDC, so that our teams could have consistent architecture. And Steve Eastham here will start talking about that. Cool. All right, so what our CDC, as we call it uh, internally, provides us. Um, an innovation catalyst. So all of our teams that are developing you know, new NoSQL platforms or new caching platforms, you know, they have a place to go. It's self-service. I uh, want to do a quick shout out to everyone that was involved in Essex. Uh, we launched this a little over a year ago. It launched on a beta version of Essex. You know, along the way, we did a few patches here and there, but it's been rock solid. Uh, we're going to talk about it in our, uh, our breakout session today, but just want to say thanks to all the development and, uh, and testing that went into that. Um, our teams have a push button. They've developed a push button. Uh, uh, development environment. Uh, they codenamed it OmniTank. I have no idea why it's OmniTank, but it's an awesome name. Uh, Self-service APIs, so teams can go in, they can launch their own environments. Uh, we were speaking yesterday about this, and we use Jenkins to actually launch Jenkins, so teams can have their own push-button Jenkins. Uh, we have uh, also use it for early integration. One of the things you want to do in web development is not wait a really long time to integrate with the other teams. If you do, you'll run into trouble, and uh, you know, that kicks your development cycle way back. It's all about speed. And again, automated testing at scale can run a lot of Jenkins uh, uh, executors and uh, really reduce our automated testing time to just a few minutes. We can run through a full regression suite. And uh, really getting away from manual touching and changing of our environments, you know, getting to the point where you know, everything's automated and that reduces the variability. So, talked about that, one more. All right. Um, what we knew, when we went into this, uh, we actually didn't know we were gonna have our new platform approved. And this is back in mid-circuit, you know, mid-2011. We, we ran a VSM, or value stream mapping exercise, and saw that you know, our, our major release for BestBuy.com was consuming $500,000 you know, mainly due to environment setup, you know, discrepancies, availability problems. And uh, we talked about that parallel development, really needed uh, uh, a way to support a lot of teams running on all in parallel. Uh, and then the high cost of infrastructure, our current ecosystem of partners, they were, uh, they were charging us upwards of $20,000 just to provision a managed VM, you know, with monitoring and everything. So uh, what we didn't know, didn't know that we're gonna have the green light for a new platform that Joel covered, didn't know how fast we're gonna have to get to actually get it out the door before holiday. And uh, what it does for us as far as a culture, um, we're building a culture at Best Buy around self-managed, you know, developer-driven teams. And uh, you know, we really wanna let them run, do their own, you know, launch in, run their own environments, kinda get away from the blame game, get away from that center of excellence uh, you know what's missing in the center of excellence? Probably the excellence. Uh, the the uh, parallel development, we talked about that, I don't know how many times about parallel development, but, uh, and then, you know, allowing the teams to innovate. They want to test some new cache platform, some new NoSQL platform. You know, here's an API. You know, here's a Jenkins job you can run. You know, run your OmniTank. Uh, and then, you know, finally, it's all about you know, reducing that cycle, that, you know, going through test, dev, test, dev, release, you know, so really reducing the delta to get code complete, to get, you know, all the way pushed out to, to release to world. 
And this is one of our teams. It's a Transformers team. They are uh, working on some of that complex middleware, or what we call aggregate services, and uh, they use the heck out of the CDC. Uh, it's, it's totally transformed their work, so cool. Here's another team, Customer Graph. Uh, you'll start seeing big changes in the way we deal with profiles, some of our, our personalization in the site, and uh, these guys are actively working on that and using the CDC. Cool. All right. Thank you, guys, for, uh, Thank you. Thank you guys for coming and, and, uh, and talking with us about this today. One of the things that you were telling me before was how you got started with OpenStack, that this was really kind of um, sort of a, a, a side project almost. Yeah, I mean, we, we have a lot, a lot of things to do, and uh, you know, we were spending a lot of money. We talked about that just to get a provision VM for our dev teams or to run a Jenkins executor. And so you know, we kind of put together that business case, and you know, it started with just one rack of servers, and we took a, a couple of our dev teams, mainly Java devs, some of these guys are out here, and uh, they uh, learned you know, Python. They, you know, they learned, uh, you know, uh, we also use Chef, so they learned you know, the Ruby. So uh, some of them don't want to go back, right? They've <laughs> yeah. kind of converted, so. Well, that's great. Thank you guys for, uh, for coming and talking about it. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you. This, uh, this final user that we're gonna bring up is uh, another, uh, another company that you probably all are familiar with and have all interacted with in some way, especially if um, you, know, you watch TV, for instance. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's really exciting what uh, we're gonna hear about today is we're gonna, we're gonna have Comcast out here and they're gonna be talking about um, some of their new services that they're developing and how OpenStack plays a part in that. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and bring out uh, an SVP from Comcast, Mark Meal. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks. Well, good morning, everybody. Let's get our slide up here. Uh, I am Mark Meal from Comcast. It's great to be here. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about Comcast since we have a very diverse international audience that may not be familiar to everyone. We are a $60 billion uh, media technology news and entertainment company. And we have two primary businesses, Comcast Cable, with mo which most people in the US, I suspect, are fairly familiar with, and also NBC Universal. The cable company uh, is the primary provider, or is the largest provider in the US of video, internet, and telephone services. And we do that primarily under this brand called Xfinity. NBC Universal operates 30 news and entertainment cable channels. They broad, uh, two different broadcast channels with NBC and Telemundo, and have uh, TV production, studio production groups, Universal Theme Parks, and Universal Studios movie production group. So we have a lot of diverse businesses, and we uh, started our investigation of OpenStack maybe a year or so ago. But let me tell you a little bit about where we were coming from when we started to look for some underlying infrastructure technology that could help us solve some problems. One thing that might not be obvious to you, uh, since you don't live in the world that, that I live in every day, is developing software in our current widely deployed t uh, cable service is, is somewhat difficult. It's a very vertically integrated platform. It is something that we typically buy, the set-top box, some intermediate communication infrastructure, and some servers, all from the same company. We have very little visibility into how that system works. We really can't get into the software. It takes us a long time to make changes on that platform. All of the intelligence is in the box that's sitting in your house for that service. There's very little that we can do outside of that box, and that box is pretty limited. So we decided that we needed to try to change the paradigm. And so we've been building for the last few years this platform called X1, which we're going to demonstrate for you today, here, live. And you'll see that this, you won't be able to see because we don't want our customers to be able to see, but I'll tell you that this platform, all of the communication that we're sending back and forth from our set-top box to our network is going through stuff that's running on top of our OpenStack production cloud. So this is a real world, thank you. 
This is our real world next generation guide experience going to be demonstrated for you live. And maybe I can get Jonathan to come out here and maybe he's willing to help do the demonstration. We'll just pull out our little set-top box here, hopefully without breaking our remote. <laughs> there we go. Would you like the remote? Sure. You're going to let me play with it? I will. <laughs> so let me just set this up a little bit. You know, so our plan here was to put, move, move most of the intelligence out of this set-top box, which is hard for us to develop on, and move it into the cloud. So that's a pretty standard model for everybody. We understand how that works. I just want to also brag a little bit that we were able to build most of the stuff in this cloud on other OpenStack software. So uh, I'm sorry, on other open source software. So not only are we on OpenStack, but we're doing a lot of what you're about to see with open source software. This lets us build a much more personalized experience that puts content in front of users and makes our experience much more about content and getting you to the content that you want faster. All right, so let's cut to our demo. Here we our go. time is here, and a little eight-year-old boy is I think we can probably take the audio down if you want. You just, you know, that way we can hear our little voiceover. All right, so we are, this is some live TV we're looking at right now. So why don't we, uh, one of the neat things we can do is just search by typing. So you've got the remote. Okay, so. You can just start typing for maybe Serenity or something. Serenity? It's Anybody a good movie. Serenity fans out there? Serenity of the movie? A few. There we go. All right. And so here you can see it was easy to find. You, uh, Jonathan just started typing, and it does, uh, sends all that information. Every single keystroke goes into the cloud. We analyze the search that you're trying to conduct. We figure out whether you're searching for a channel, for a particular call sign for a network, if you're searching for content like movies or maybe even actors. And then we try to propose some search results. And let me just mention, you see the Rotten Tomatoes ratings up here. We decided that consumers might be curious about what uh, cr critics or other moviegoers thought about, their, thought about this movie that they're considering to purchase or watch. And so we integrated, we did a deal with uh, Flickster, and we integrated their Rotten Tomatoes service, and it took us about three weeks to do that. In the old model, where we have all the intelligence on the set-top box, it's impossible to load all this data, first of all, into the limited foot, you know, memory footprint in the set-top box. And here we can do it all in the cloud and just send the data back. Uh, I'm playing around. You feel free. <laughs> feel free. So can, here we are. Can we in the cut DDR. the sound on the uh, on the X1 totally? Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so this is uh, the DVR here. This is all built in and, mm -hmm. and pulled up. You can up see up. scheduled recordings. You can see the recordings that you've got. We preserve deleted recordings. Deadliest catch in Phineas and Ferb. That's uh, quite a selection. <laughs> <laughs> I have four kids. Phineas and Ferb is big in my house. And Big Bang Theory, that's one of my favorites. Okay. So here we see, um, maybe hit the OK button there. Yeah, that's perfect. So we, you've decided that you want to look at Big Bang Theory. You go over to the right a little bit, as you saw Jonathan do, and you can see that we've got six different seasons or episodes that are involved in six different seasons of Big Bang Theory available to you. And we tell you whether it's available on our on-demand service or pre-recorded on your DVR or if it's on broadcast television. And then you can set recordings and do everything else that you want to do um, directly from this interface. How about we uh, show some apps? Sure. OK. So back to the menu here. Yep. So you've got your obligatory weather and traffic apps, but sports, I think, is a good one. So one of the frustrations that I have when I'm trying to figure out you know, where the baseball game is or the football game or the NCAA game or whatever, uh, it's hard to remember sometimes which channel is actually carrying the game that you care about or whether maybe your team is playing today or what time the game is on. So as Jonathan just went through, you can see that we've got this application that comes up and helps you find the stuff that you care about. You can find your team. You can set up a recording. If the game is in session, unfortunately, we're here in the morning, but uh, we have a couple of set-top boxes that are scattered around the conference. One, for example, is in the Cisco booth. If you go and play with it while a baseball game is on, you'll actually see the game in progress. And so we're integrating that real-time sports feed with the program guide information. And if you just walk into your house and you want to tune it up, you just select that game, and it'll let you tune directly to the game. Or you can just get a quick update on the game by seeing what's on the app. This would be impossible for us to do on our old platform. What do you think? I think it's very cool. Cool. So um, first of all, that was very brave. <laughs> yep. 
This is live on OpenStack. Yeah, and I think this is, this is probably the first time that we've had a set-top box demo up here. Yep. This is not, not the normal way that we think of OpenStack and, and interacting with OpenStack. So that's very cool. Thank you for, uh, for bringing that here today. Glad to do it. Thanks All a right. lot. So we, uh, we had some great users there with Bloomberg, um, Best Buy, Comcast. And uh, you know, I, I really appreciate that, uh, that they came and, and talked to us today. And I think that, that it does help illustrate how critical um, you know, it is to have all of those parts of a platform ecosystem. And I think it's also nice you know, to see what are we building here and where is it going? Because you can sit there and, and write code. You can check it in. I've written a lot of code in my lifetime. <laughs> and, uh, and sometimes you, know, you, you wonder, like, what's actually happening to this when I, when I push it out? And this is what, where it's going. I mean, this is the software that, that you're building, software that we're designing here this week. It's going to all of these places and more. And, and that is really impressive. Um, you know, this is just a, a quick list of other organizations that are running OpenStack right now. It's really, really incredible. So, you know, I mean, I think the, the, what this community has done together is nothing short of amazing. And, uh, and I just, you know, I love working on it every day. So thank you all for, for making OpenStack great. And, uh, and I want to thank everyone who's involved in it. You know, it is a massive effort from developers, from companies, from people who are supporting it, sponsoring it, working on it. And, uh, and also, you, know, you might have known we had a little bit of a late start today. Sorry about that. Um, we, we've obviously thrown them some, some challenging uh, items today. I want to say a special thank you to the people who put this event together. You know, we all create a lot of work <laughs> for, for a bunch of people. And so thank you to F and Tech, and thank you to the OpenStack Foundation team that has, that has put this together. So this so I hope you have a great summit. There is um, one more thing that I wanted to mention here. I know there's a, a question about where are we going to go next. So last year we made a promise that we were going to be international sometime this year, and we are in the stages of finalizing the next OpenStack Summit in Hong Kong in November of 2013. And, uh, and this is, uh, I think, going to be a, a great opportunity for us to continue to spread OpenStack around the world. So that's, uh, that's all the time I'm going to take.